All right, praise the Lord. Well, hey, last week, um, you know, for you guys that were here, that was amazing. Um, the Lord just took over the service and took us in a completely different direction. Um, and um, about the power of the anointing. <sighs> yes, that was powerful. That was powerful. The power of the anointing. The power, the power of the anointing. Because you have that power in you now. See? So it's just, it's, it's, it's just about us. Remember, it's according to our faith. So we're going to believe for a greater flow of his anointing through our lives. A greater level of operation, a greater level of manifestation. And the truth is that 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 typically comes uh, when there's a greater revelation. And so, you know, it's about really digging in, getting those scriptures in our hearts, letting his word, meditating on his word, letting it get deep into our hearts. Because anything, listen, anything that you think or say enough eventually it'll get down into your life to the point where it controls your life good or bad good or bad once it gets in there it'll control your life praise the lord okay well um so i have a message tonight the lord has instructed me to share he uh, showed me this a few days ago um so i want to share this with you guys go uh, with me first to first uh, Samuel chapter three. So let me just give a little backstory just to kind of let you guys know where, where we're picking this up here. Um, so this is at the time where, you know, Saul had been after David and had been looking to kill him. And um, so he'd be chasing after him and, you know, um, um, David and Saul's son, Jonathan, had kind of concocted a plan to get David away so he escaped and ran and he was just basically on the run and um, and he had taken <clears throat> uh, 600 men with him from his town of Ziglag and so you know he had these men with him as he was on the run and um, and as they got back to Ziglag, and now there's more in that, but I, we don't need to go into all that. I'm just giving you a quick general synopsis of where we're at here. So he had left <clears throat> because he had kind of gotten up with the Israelite army, and, and they still didn't trust him because of what was going on with him and Saul. So they... Um, I think it was Akish was was um, taking care of him. He said, look, you got to get out of here. They don't trust you. Go. So he took his men and they went back to Ziglag, his, his town. So let's pick that up there. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, we'll start in verse 1. Well, let's just read verse 11 of chapter 29, just so you get the idea here. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day, that the Amalekites had, had invaded the south. And Ziglag and had smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken the women that were therein 
they had taken all the women captive that were in the city of Ziglai. They slew not any, I mean, they didn't kill any of them, either great or small, but they carried them away and went on their way. Okay? So now David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons, daughters, were taken captives. So here David had been gone. And so now he comes back and comes back to the city of Ziglag. His wives are gone. All of his children are gone. Entire city has been burned. So he comes back and he realizes now he's left with nothing. And of course, not just his wives and children, but the wives of all the men that were in his group with him and that had left their families, had left their wives and their children to go with David to help him, to protect him. And so now they come back. Now their wives are gone. All their children are gone. Verse 4. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake <clears throat> of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself, Lord his God. Now I know we've heard that scripture a lot. It's a very familiar scripture, and for good reason. But I, I want to I, I want us to really I want us to really see this here, to really get the full picture of what was going on when David encouraged himself in the Lord. Okay? I want you to picture this. He's taken these 600 men, saying, hey, come with me, help me, protect me. We're going to go off and do this. So they leave to serve him. And they return, and now all their wives and all their sons and daughters are gone. And, and not only that, but everything they had burned and stolen. Everything they had had either been stolen or burned. And so they come back, and now they're left with nothing. Now, the, in verse 6, it says, and David was greatly distressed. <laughs> See, they're, they're all about to kill him. Okay, they're about to say, look, we got, hey, David put us in this position. He's the one that caused this to happen. This is his fault. We need to stone him and kill him and make him pay for what he did. So, so he's got 600 men raging mad at him, about to kill him. So, yes. You could say he was greatly distressed, okay? He was greatly distressed. And, and, and by the way, not only that, not only is he facing the reality of all these men that are up and about ready to kill him, but David's own family is gone. His family is gone. He comes back. His, his family has been taken from him. Including everything he had. So he comes back. His family is gone. Wives gone. Gone. All his possessions are gone. 
and the city has been burned to the ground. And on top of that, he's got 600 men about ready to kill him. So yeah, he was greatly distressed. I looked it up <clears throat> in a few other <clears throat> translations. And it says, um, the, the DRA version says he was greatly afflicted. He was greatly afflicted, but he, but David took courage from the Lord his God. EHV says David was under a great deal of pressure. He was under a great deal of pressure. Everything he had was lost. His family's gone. Everything he owns gone. And I was under the pressure of not only that, but 600 men wanting to kill him and blaming him for their families <clears throat> being taken and all their possessions being stolen. The GNV, the Good News Version, says, David was in great sorrow. He was in great sorrow. I mean, his family is gone. His family is gone. Everything he had in his life is gone. He was in great sorrow. But David comforted himself. Comforted himself and the Lord his God. Why? Because of the relationship he had with his God. Because of the trust that he had in his God. I mean, we talked probably a couple of years ago now, you know, where we <clears throat> taught that message on on David and Goliath and some of the stuff from David, David had seen the Lord deliver him in these crazy situations. So even in he was able to comfort himself in the Lord because he trusted the Lord. He knew God would come through for him. He knew that no matter how impossible it looked, God would come through for him. Just like it looked impossible with Goliath, just like it looked impossible when a bear came in there trying to steal their sheep, when a lion came in, So, so he trusted the Lord more than he trusted the situation. Trusted the Lord more than he trusted what he saw in terms of what things were. Say, yeah, okay, oh, I see that. My family's gone. They're about to kill me. I have a higher reality here. I have a higher reality with God. Because God does not operate by the way that things look or the way that things seem. God operates on the supernatural level. So I'm going to trust in my God, and I'm going to comfort myself in the Lord. I know that he's going to come through. I don't know what he's going to do, but I know he's going to come through for me some way. He knew it. Now think about this too, by the way. And then by the way too, so that one says he was in great sorrow. Another one, another translation says he was in anguish, that, that David was in anguish. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think about okay. 
I want you to think about the soul control that David had to have in order to be able to do what that says right there. He's in great sorrow. He's in anguish. Another translation, by the way, said he was desperate. He was desperate. His family's gone. He's desperate. Everything he had is stolen. He's in a desperate situation. And, and number two, it said, it didn't say just the man wept to the point of, of until they had no more power to weep. It said, and then David and the people that were with him, they lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power. to. They cried and wept until they couldn't weep anymore. Because they were in such sadness, because in such grief, in such an <clears throat> afflicted place, everything being left. And yet, even in that place, David had the sole control to encourage himself in the Lord, to, to take courage in the Lord his God, to take courage. Can you not do that, please? Can you go back up there for me? Thank you. Just let him. He's all right. Just let him be. See, he, he had to have had absolute soul control. Meaning, meaning, I want to say, you know what I'm talking about. I'm saying soul control. I'm talking about having control over his mind, his will, and his, and his emotions. He could have let his emotions just completely take him over the edge. Think about how easy it would have been right there in that moment for David to give up and say, you know what? What's the point? What's the use? Saul's about to kill me. And if Saul doesn't kill me, these 600 men are going to kill me. And if these 600 men aren't, don't kill me, I'll probably die of a broken heart for losing my family and losing everything that I have. What's the point? I might as well just give up. I might as well say, you know what? There's no chance. Look, there's no hope. There's no, there's no way out of this. There's no way out. I'm back into a corner. Saul, you got me. The Amalekites, you got me. I mean, if ever there's a point where he's going to do it, it's got to be right there. If ever anybody, hey, hey, man, if ever anybody was going to give up, I think that's about the time. Everything he had is gone. Everything. I'm I'm, listen to me. I'm telling you. I don't want to even tell you to imagine it because I don't want you to put that image for yourself in your mind. But I'm just trying to say. For David, he came there and he had lost everything. He lost it all. But yet, wow, he had such control over his soul that he could say, okay, now, okay, now, listen, enough, enough of the crying, enough of the whining, enough of the lamenting my case and pitying myself. I got to get before the Lord. I got to get before the Lord. And so what he does is he encourages himself in the Lord. He comforts himself in the Lord. Okay, now verse 7. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. Okay. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So, now the ephod is what, they, is what he would use to inquire of the Lord. Now, um, so, so verse eight, and David inquired at the Lord. Now, now I want you to think about this now, because this is, this is critical. Okay. David didn't just go from weeping until he had no more power to weep 
and then go right into inquiring from the Lord. Okay. He, he, he didn't go right from wailing and crying. And, no, no. and then go right into, okay, Lord, what do you got for me? What, what should I do here? He, he didn't do that. I, wa I, wa I want you to see, I want you to see how David did this because this is critical. See, he was in a bad position. He was beaten down. He was, he was, he was ready to give up. I'm assuming that's just my uh, assumption. But he was cornered and he was in anguish and he was in a tough spot. And he didn't turn right around and go, okay, Lord, and try to seek the Lord and get an answer. No. What he did first was he stopped. He took control of the soul and all the emotions and all the negative feelings and all the negative thoughts that he was having. And he stopped all that mess first. And then he strengthened, strengthened himself or it's encouraged himself in the Lord. Meaning he took courage from the Lord. He took strength from the Lord. Going back to what we talked about last week, you could say he took the anointing or he took the power or he took the might from the Lord. And he got himself strengthened back up again in the Lord. And he, and, he, and he got himself strong first before he went to speak with the Lord about it. Why? Because how, he, how is he going to go to the Lord except going to the Lord by faith? He, he can't go to the Lord in any way except by faith. If he goes to the Lord whining and crying, what is he going to get from the Lord? The Bible says we have to come boldly. Meaning we come before the Lord, not arrogantly. That's nonsense. You know that. I know that. Everybody knows that. But we're talking about coming to the Lord boldly, meaning we come to the Lord with confidence. Okay, we come to the Lord with faith, trusting him, confident that he has an answer for me in this situation. We come to the Lord with faith, trusting him, boldly saying, okay, Lord, I know you have a solution here. I know you're going to bail me out of this thing. I know you are. Because, Lord, you always do it. And this is not any different. But, 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 but. We have to get out of that place of pitying, feeling sorry for ourselves, you know, the negativity. We, we got to get out of that mess first. We, we have to take the time to, to, to take control over our soul and have that soul control to say soul. Well, we, we all know that scripture. What is the famous scripture from David? It says, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. <laughs> so, of course, we know he's famous for that. See, he's famous for telling his soul what to do. And this right here is that scripture in action. That's him actually acting it out, showing his faith. See, so he stopped all the negative emotions, all the negative feelings. He said, no, okay, wait a minute. I, I can't go down that road because that's not going to bring me anything that is positive. Nothing. Right? So he first strengthens himself in the Lord. He, 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 okay, I, I, I would say this way. He gets himself back into a place of faith. Okay. Now, okay, now I'm back trusting you again, Lord. Now I'm ready to do this. Now, okay, Lord, what do you got for me? What are we going to do here? Because now I've strengthened myself in the Lord. I've, I've taken courage from the Lord. I've taken might from the Lord. I've taken courage. I've taken power. I've taken wisdom from the Lord. I'm ready. See? So now he comes to the Lord. And David inquires of the Lord, and he says, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? 
Now, what didn't David ask? He didn't ask, hey, Lord, should I just give up? <laughs> right? Did he say, hey, Lord, should I just give up here? Hey, Lord, should I just let them have my family? Should I just let them keep my wives? Should I just let them keep my children? Should I just let them keep all my stuff? He didn't say that. He said, Lord, look, should I go after him and should I overtake him? Why? Because he was confident that if he wanted to go and overtake them, overtake the Amalekites and go and take his family back and take all his stuff back and take all his men's wives back and take all their children back and take all their stuff back. Oh, ho, ho. hey, hey, Mo, whoa, man, hey, listen to me, oh, man, he knew that he could do it, he knew it, I, hey, man, Lord, should I go do it or not, meaning, meaning, Lord, are you going to let me go and overtake them or not, are you going to let me go and do it, Lord, because you know if I pursue them, I will overtake them. <laughs> hey, hey, he knew it. He knew it. And see, that's why he was able to encourage himself in the Lord and strengthen himself in the Lord because he knew. Man, he knew God's given me something here. God is on my side. God is with me. And as long as God is with me, and as long as God is on my side, I can not lose. He knew that. I mean, he took down Goliath that was almost 10 feet tall. The Bible says he was nine feet, nine inches tall. That's a big man. And David wasn't real big when he took him down. So David knew, hey, man, if I want to take him, I will. If I want to overtake them, I will do it. But Lord, are you going to let me? So he says, he says, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. Now watch this. <clears throat> and without fail, recover all. So whatever the enemy has taken from your life, whether it's your peace, whether it's your hope, whether it's your health, um, money, destiny, family members, relationships, jobs, whatever. Hey, man, whatever the enemy has stolen from you, The Lord instructed me to tell you, it's time to pursue. It's time to overtake them, overtake that enemy. And it's time to recover once again. Now, it didn't say just recover some. No. He said, watch this. Without fail, you will recover all meaning everything that that enemy stole from you without fail, meaning you will not fail, meaning you will not lose a thing, you will not miss a thing, you will recover it all. You will recover it all. You'll recover all. Now watch this. This this is now watch it, guys. What happens next is apps. Okay, and by the way, by the way, I, I, forgot, I forgot to mention this. Ooh, okay, can I just mention one? Can I just ooh, re, on a rewind this story for just a minute? Because there's one more thing I wanted to point out to you about David b before before he inquired of the Lord. Okay, this is powerful because when he when he got back and everything and his family was gone, 
all the men's families were gone. David, those men were ready to kill him. But I want you to think about this. Why didn't they kill him? Why didn't they kill him? There were 600 of them and one of him. In their mind, it was his fault. They were blaming him. It was because of him that they all lost their family. Their families and everything they owned. They were ready to kill him. They were all ready to stone him, kill him. But see, God wouldn't let them do that to him. See, God will protect you from people hurting you, from people harming you, even though they may wish harm to you, God will stop it. Think back. You know, with this, this story, you know what it reminded me of? Was when Jesus, when he was, he was in the midst of all these, you know, Pharisees and all these, and he was, and he was challenging all of their religious doctrine, and boy, did it make him mad. And so they were going to stone him and kill him. And Jesus disappeared from their sight, and he escaped out right in the midst of all of them. He became invisible to their eyes, so he was able to just walk right out, and they couldn't kill him. See, God will protect you from people trying to do you harm. He will protect you from people trying to do you harm. They may try. They may have intentions to do you harm. But God will protect you and he will shut it down. That's what he did for David. That's what he did for Jesus. He'll do for you. I mean, you remember, you, I've told you guys my story many times about when I was in, uh, at work. This is years ago. But the guy tried to push me, and the Lord has made me a rock. And he pushed with his own force. He pushed himself, flew back into the wall, fell to the ground. That's supernatural protection. Supernatural. That's what God does. God gives you supernatural protection. Okay, now we can pick back up where we were. <clears throat> so David inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says to him, okay, you know what, David, pursue, and you shall overtake them. And, this, without fail, you shall recover it all. Oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, hey, you will recover it all. Man, everything that you've ever lost in your life, you will recover it all. Wow. Oh, my. Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, you will recover all. Wow. Boy, I need that, man. Let me tell you what. <laughs> I mean, I need that. Woo! I mean, just say that right now. I will recover all. Say it again. I will recover all. Now watch this. Without fail, I will recover all. Hey, hey, hey. see, that's 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 what he's doing. He's put he's positioning us, saying, "Listen, it's time to stop letting the enemy walk all over you and take your stuff. It's time for you to pursue and overtake him and recover it all." You know. Uh, David Oyedipo over in Africa, he has something he says all the time. He says, enough is enough. <laughs> okay? Enough is enough. All right? Enough is enough. It's time. It's time to pursue. It's time to overtake. It's time to recover all in Jesus. 
that's what time it's 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 time enough is enough enough is enough enough of letting this enemy walk all over us and and take our stuff take health or take finances take relationships take family take whatever uh-uh no more no more no more it ends tonight that ends tonight that ends tonight thank you lord That ends tonight. See, and that was the message the Lord had for me to share last week. Now we're going to get to it. I'm hoping maybe we'll get to it next week. But for tonight, the Lord told me this was tonight's message. But the, the rebel, oh. man, I'm telling you guys, he's been giving me so much revelation out of this Old Testament. I'm telling you, I, 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 man. And I mean, I always get revelation out of it, but I don't know what is going on. But he, he, he's just opening up even so much more than he usually does to me. Um, oh, it's just been amazing. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> anyway, oh, but what, but what I was saying, the message that he had for me last week that we're going to talk about, because he, he, he was talking to me about Joshua. And he started getting into some of the things with Joshua and how he went in, you know, because he was the one that let him in. He's the one that crossed the Jordan. He's the one that let him in and took possession of that land. But the Lord was talking to me about, look, we got to stop being so passive. Whew. We got to stop being so passive. We got to stop being so passive and letting the enemy do what he wants. We got to start taking back our stuff. We got to start taking back our peace, taking back our family, taking back our money. Whoa. <sighs> Okay, let me, uh, okay, let me, let me keep going here. Man, I did not, I did not think I'd preach this hard. This is, <clears throat> okay. So now verse nine, let's pick up there. He said, man, without fail, you're going to recover it all. You're going to pursue. You're going to overtake them. You're going to recover it all. So, <clears throat> verse 9, David went. Hold on, I need a drink of water. Okay. So, David went. He and the 600 men that were with him, and they came to the brook, to the brook Bezor, where those that were left <clears throat> stayed behind. But David pursued he and the 400 men. So 400 men were with him. 200 men stayed back with their stuff. So David pursued he and the 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bezor. Now, and they found an Egyptian in the field. <laughs> so, so there, so there, <laughs> it's just crazy, you guys. So, so they, so out of nowhere, they just find this Egyptian. So they bring him to David and they gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water. And then they gave him a piece of uh, a cake of figs, two clusters of raisins, you know, so they're, they're feeding him, they're getting him you know, his strength back. And it says, and when he had eaten, his spirit came <clears throat> again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, to whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And there's, who do you belong to? Where did you come from? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. 
<clears throat> we made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast, which belongs to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag, <clears throat> and we burned Ziglag with fire. So now David realizes, whoa, wait a minute now. <laughs> no, you got to see this. The Lord, the Lord just brought someone right into his lap to lead them right to where they needed to go. See, God will send you whoever or whatever he needs to in order to lead you in the place you need to go. See, he, he just brought it to David. He just brought this Egyptian out on his own, all by himself. They find him in the field, they bring him to David. So David said to him, okay, can you bring me down to your company? And he said, uh, well, okay, swear to me unto, uh, unto me by God that you will not kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master. Um, and then I'll bring you down to the company. You know, so he's like, look, uh, fine, I'll lead you there, but just don't kill me. And don't turn me back over to my master because he'll probably kill me. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. <laughs> now watch this. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. <clears throat> now watch this, verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. <clears throat> David recovered everything they had stolen from him. Rescued his two wives. He got his children back. He got all of his possessions back. He got all of his goods back. Now watch this. <clears throat> and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. <clears throat> so I want you to see that because David didn't just recover everything that he had, that he had lost. He recovered everything he had lost. And then some on top of it. See, if the enemy steals something, God will return it to Just as it was, it always comes back better. There's always more with it than what you lost. So he makes the enemy pay interest on what he steals from you. In the book of Job, it said Job was restored double. In the book of Proverbs, <clears throat> it says that the thief is stolen, he has to return sevenfold what he stole. So God is always going to return to you more than whatever it is that you lost. He will always return to you more than whatever it is that you lost. the Lord. <clears throat> um, 
let me just continue. Let me just read a little more of this. I, I want you to see this. Uh, verse 21. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made aside, <clears throat> I'm sorry, who had made also to abide at the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him when David came near to the people, and he saluted them. Then <clears throat> answered all the wicked men and all the men of Belial, which means worthless men, um, of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them anything of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man, his wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. So he, they, they were trying to say, hey, look, they didn't come with us and fight. So all they, all they should get back is their families, nothing else. <clears throat> then said, David, you shall not do so, my brethren with that which the Lord hath given us. See, who gave it to them? See, they're acting like it's their stuff to do with as they please. But God gave it to them. God gave it to them. That's what it says. He said, you will not do that, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us. And who has preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. You're not going to do that with what the Lord has given. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goes down to battle, so shall his part be that tarried by the stuff. They shall part it alike or they shall divide it up alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziglag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. See, David recovered so much <clears throat> that there was plenty for the 400 men that went and fought, plenty for the 200 men that stayed behind. Plenty for himself as extra. And then, even had so much, he was able to give it out to the elders of Judah. God is telling you it's time to recover all. It's time to stop sitting back and letting the enemy do whatever he wants. And it's time to pursue and overtake and recover everything that you have lost in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for this word tonight. <clears throat> we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is time. It is time for us to pursue, for us to overtake, for us to recover all. Lord, just like you brought the Egyptian right into David's lap to lead him right to where his stuff was, Lord, we ask you, bring us those same keys that we need that will lead us right back to our stuff to take back our health, to take back our money, to take back our families, to take back our destinies, to take back jobs to take back relationships, to take back peace, to take back love. Thank you, Lord. Because he didn't have to struggle and strive for it. You just delivered, into, in, you delivered it into his hand. You brought him the master key that led him right to it. And you delivered his enemy and all of his stuff into his hand. And we ask for you to do the same for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Sure. Okay, now, time for our offering message. Woo-woo, woo-woo. Praise the Lord. Get excited. See, because just like David inquired of the Lord, 
And he told them to pursue and overtake. The Lord instructed me to do this back, whatever it was, maybe a month and a half or so ago, two months ago. And he said, here, let me read. Let me see. Let me see if I have this in here. There's something in here I read that I thought, oh, wow. Here we go. <clears throat> he says, oh, this is, this is from Jerry. He says, if you're a pastor. Oh, here, let me read this. He says, talking about these outlines on prosperity and success. He says, if you're a lay person, study them until they become a revelation to you. If you're a preacher, you can preach from them just as I did. If you're a pastor, preach from one of them every week in your church for an entire year. You'll be amazed at the results that will come. A congregation that is prospering and a church that is successful. Praise the Lord. And the Lord instructed me to do that. He said, I want you to take one of these and, 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 and teach one of these lessons each week for the offering message. And so praise the Lord, that's what we've been doing. And it's been amazing. Now, tonight's message <clears throat> or lesson is Divine Prosperity Part 3. This is lesson number six. Now, divine prosperity is the result of total consecration of one's life to God. Okay, I'm going to say that again. <clears throat> divine prosperity is the result of total consecration of one's life to God. Okay, Mark 10. Verse 27, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Now, God wants us to have riches, but he wants us to be free from the trust in riches. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 4 through 16. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read a, a section from verse 5. And it says... <clears throat> As it says, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. See, he was seeking the Lord. And as a result of seeking the Lord, the prosperity came. He didn't have to go seeking after the money. He sought the Lord and the Lord brought the prosperity as a result of seeking him. Because he always, God always wants us to put him first place. We have to trust him, not money. We have to trust him, not feelings. We have to trust him, not circumstances. He wants us to trust him above everything, to seek him above everything. See, so as long as Uzziah kept God first place in his life, he prospered. But when he stopped, then trouble came. Now, Matthew 6, 24 says, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon, meaning God and money. So wealth and riches belong to the child of God. But they are to be received, not pursued. Boy, that's powerful. Wealth and riches are to be received, not pursued. God will bring you the money. Just like God brought David the Egyptian that he needed to go and get all their stuff back, God will bring you the money. We don't have to pursue it. We pursue God. See, pursuing riches will only hinder you from enjoying real prosperity. The example is Jacob. Read Genesis 25, chapter 25 through 32. It talks about the story of Jacob. It, the story shows... <clears throat> That it was Jacob's desire to become rich. It was his greatest desire. In fact, he was willing to do anything to acquire it. He had seen how God had prospered and blessed his grandfather Abraham. And he coveted that prosperity. What he failed to realize was that it was Abraham's consecration to God that caused him to become wealthy. See, Jacob's greed led him to bargain Esau out of his birthright and to deceive Isaac into bestowing Esau's blessing. 
As a result of his pursuit of riches, he was forced to leave home never again to see his mother. He was forced to flee for his life from his enraged brother, Esau. He later was deceived into marrying a wife that he did not want. He had his wages lowered or changed 10 times. And he was forced to leave by an angry father-in-law. It was not, well, let me read this, Genesis 32, 28. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. It was not until he, to- <clears throat> I'm sorry, it was not until he surrendered totally to God that he began to enjoy real prosperity. God has dealt graciously with me, and I have enough. That's Genesis 30, verse 43. Jacob was <clears throat> to later enjoy great prosperity. The Apostle Paul warns you of pursuing wealth. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11. But those who desire to be rich fall into a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. We don't have to pursue riches. God will give them to us if we will trust totally in him. Whether you are rich or poor, become a giver. Giving is the essence of living. When we are blessed, we are to give. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. We should be ready to distribute and willing to communicate and to be rich in good works. The law of God is give. Life is centered around how much of ourselves we can give, not how much we can get. Second Corinthians chapter 8, 3 through 5. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were willing, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. They first gave themselves to the Lord. This expresses a deep commitment and dedication to Jesus and his service. They gave themselves for the ministering to the saints. Give yourself to God first, give yourself to God first, and then your substance. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. So measure it out. Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole steal no, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Once again, we see that all we do is centered around giving. God will see to it that the return will be great. Increase your giving. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. I'm sorry, this is Ephesians 6, 6 through 8. Doing the will of God from the heart. 
with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Remember this, no matter how much you may be blessed in wealth, riches, material blessings, God wants you to always remain dependent upon him. Well, Father, we thank you for that <clears throat> teaching tonight. We consecrate ourselves to you, Lord. We surrender ourselves to you. We trust wholly and completely only in you. And as we give tonight, as we sow into your kingdom, into your church, as, as worship to you, Lord, as obedience, as love and appreciation for what we are receiving, We thank you that you always give more back to us than we give to you because you are such a gracious and generous God. And so I thank you, Lord, for supernatural returns on every single seed that is sown. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.